Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg and I'm here to do an annual rite of passage, the mid-year book freakout tag. This is the fifth time I have done this tag since I joined BookTube. It's just a really fun thing to do as a sort of check-in for the middle of the year to see how the reading year is shaping up and check in about what you've read and what you've liked and some fun things like that. I believe the original creator of this tag is no longer on YouTube. It was Is That Cami, and I feel like it's still important to mention that she was the creator. Um, I'll have links to my other iterations of this video from the past down below, as well as links to some related content that you can check out if you are so interested. Let's just get to the prompt. Again, I haven't really done tag videos in a while, but this is one that is always a lot of fun to do. So let's just really get into the nitty gritty, all of the prompts, and start talking about it. Because again, I just think this is a fun one. Prompt number one is, what is the best book you've read so far? Undoubtedly, it's The Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois by Honoré Fanon Jeffers. If you follow along, you know I was sort of on a journey with this book. I started it in 2022 and then put it down and always intended to get back to it. I finally got back to it this year and finished it. I knew I was going to love it once I did, and I sure did. It's a fantastic book, and I cannot recommend it enough. Honestly, it's just a tremendous book, and it makes me even more upset that it didn't win the Pulitzer Prize for fiction last year don't want to talk about it. It hurts. <laughs> but it's a fantastic book. I am going to have to decide what I'm going to do with my E.M. Forster rereads because I'm doing an E.M. Forster read-along. I'll have information about that down below if you'd like to check it out. And E.M. Forster is my favorite author. So it's going to be difficult as we head into the second part of the year because we're going to be getting to some of the really big E.M. Forster titles. But I, I, so if I had to pick one overall, because I think I'm going to separate rereads and first time reads. This is a first time read. But for the first half of the year, at least, this has, you know, A Room with a View by E.M. Forster is the only competition that it had. And I think I'd still give it to the love songs of W.E.B. Du Bois. So that is my answer for the best book I have read this year so far. Prompt number two is the best sequel you've read so far. So I haven't read a whole lot of sequels. I mean, I have read uh, two, I think, Neo Marsh books, which feature a detective named uh, Roderick Allen. I didn't really like either one of them. And I am trying to remember offhand if there was anything else that would really qualify as a sequel. And I can't remember if there was anything. Even if there was, it, it wouldn't necessarily be something that I would like. So I know this is a stretch. It's not strictly speaking, a sequel. But I think spiritually, it is very much tied to a previous book, uh, The Duchess of Bloomsbury Street by Helene Hanf. Again, it's not a sequel to 84 Charing Cross Road, except it kind of is. In 84 Charing Cross Road, well, that book consists of letters that Helene Hanf wrote back and forth to a bookstore in London. In them, she talks a lot about how much she wants to go to London, and her desire for a trip is thwarted throughout it. After the publication of that book, a UK publisher decides to publish it over there, and they invite her to do publicity in London. So, of course, she jumps at the opportunity, and someone tells her you should keep a diary. So this small little book is the diary of her trip to London. And because you've been on this journey with her through 84 Charing Cross Road, it really feels spiritually linked to 84 Charing Cross Road. So even though it's not technically a sequel, I'm going to count it. You know, my channel, my rules. And I, I just thought it was a really fun book. 84 Charing Cross Road will always be my favorite. However, this was a fun coda to that story. And I will always enjoy it with that. And when I think of 84 Charing Cross Road, I'm always going to think of Duchess of Bloomsbury Street as well as a sort of follow-up to it. Prop number three is a new release you haven't read yet but want to. So obviously this means a book that is already released and you haven't managed to read yet. I went back to my most anticipated books of 2023 video, which will be linked down below. And I went through the books that have come out that I have not read yet and decided that Page Boy, a memoir by Elliot Page, is the book that has come out. And actually it just came out that I would most be interested in reading and would give the most sense of urgency in order to pick up. I don't have a copy, and I think I'm probably going to look for it on audio. I'm assuming Elliot Page reads it. It's going to be a crime if he doesn't. Anyway, uh, this is definitely the book that I have not gotten to yet but would like to. So hopefully I'll manage to get to it in the latter part of 2023. And if you're unfamiliar, Elliot Page uh, is a transgender actor, and this memoir is about their journey to coming out and transitioning and how their experience in Hollywood. Um, 
leading up to coming out and transitioning and all of that. It sounds absolutely fascinating. I would love to read about his story and uh, I will. I will. <laughs> Hopefully soon, but I will. And then prompt number four is what is your most anticipated release for the second half of the year? If I have to pick one, it's Let Us Descend by Jessamyn Ward, which will be released on October 3rd. I have read two books by Jessamyn Ward, Salvage the Bones and Sing Unburied Sing. I think it's honestly a crime that Sing Unburied Sing did not win a Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. I talk about that in my video, which I'll put down below, where I did a deep dive on Less by Andrew Sean Greer, which is the book that won instead. Feels wildly inexplicable to me, but hey. Honestly, I think... Jessamyn Ward has been building such a reputation that it really feels like it's only a matter of time before she does win a Pulitzer Prize, and I hope that ends up being true. It feels like Let Us Descend has all the qualities that if she sticks the landing, she could make a really solid case for herself for the Pulitzer Board and Pulitzer Jury next year. It would be very interesting to see what happens, and I cannot wait to read it. If I was picking a second place, and again, my channel, my rules, I'm going to, it would be uh, The Vaster Wilds by Lauren Groff, which will be coming out on September 12th. I loved The Matrix. Actually, you can see it right there on my shelves. And it's the only book of Lauren Groff that I've read, and this one sounds sort of similar in a fun way, so I'm hoping that I will manage to pick up a copy uh, when it is released. And that would be my second choice for that prompt. And prompt number five is, what is your biggest disappointment? I thought long and hard about this because I don't know that I've had anything that was just like an out and out disappointment so far in 2023, but I'm going to go with The Furrows by Namwali Serpel because it was one of the best reviewed books of last year. It was consistently on best of lists alongside Trust by Hernan Diaz and Demon Copperhead by Barbara Kingsolver. Uh, they obviously pulled ahead in terms of those, but uh, The Furrows was up there pretty well. So I guess I kind of led myself into a hype machine for it. And when I listened to it on audio in the run up to the announcement of the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction this year, I had high hopes for it and I ended up just thinking it was fine. I, especially the second half of the book, really did not work for me. So that's kind of where it is. So, you know, if I, I'm sure they, there is a possibility that something else will crowd it out of this category by the end of the year, because like I said, I don't know that I would call it a major disappointment or anything like that. But uh, since I have to pick something, it is the one that has been most disappointing, if that makes sense. That takes us to prompt number six, which is biggest surprise. Now, last year, I read Now in November by Josephine Johnson. I did a whole Pulitzer Surprise deep dive. I'll link it down below. And I read Seven Houses, which is a memoir by Josephine Johnson. And I had wanted to read The Inland Island by Josephine Johnson. And I finally got around to it in January. And the reason this is a big surprise to me, because I really loved Now in November, and I liked Seven Houses just fine, the reason this is a surprise is that this is, is nature writing, and I haven't really ever read a piece of nature writing that made me want to go outside and experience nature and, like, pay attention, and this book did that for me in a way that nothing else has. Also, I think it actually functions as a memoir better than Seven Houses did. It feels like it's allowing itself to be a lot more honest. So basically, the premise is that there are 12 chapters, each chapter represents a month of the year. Josephine Johnson and her husband had allowed the grounds on their uh, large property, kind of like a farm, um, to go wild and grow free. And basically, she ob observes the changes in every month, uh, animals who come in and leave, and the way the plants grow and wither, and uh, all of the changes Every, not just every season, but every month. And it is really fascinating. And it really made me aware of the world around me in a way that no other book has. And uh, I, I just, again, I've never had that experience. So that was a big surprise for me. Even though I knew that I liked the work of Josephine Johnson, I just had not um, had that sensation before. I'm going to leave it out because it will come back into another uh, prompt later on in this list. Spoiler alert, I guess. Prompt number seven, favorite new author, debut, or new to you? Obviously, it's going to be Edna Ferber. So in January, I read His Family, which was the first book that has won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction. 
if you don't follow along, I should tell you I am doing a project where I'm reading every book that has won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction. I finally read the first one, His Family, earlier this year. And I wanted to read some other books that had come out the same year. One of them was Fanny Herself by Edna Ferber. And that's the only Edna Ferber book I have read so far. So it feels weird to say new favorite author because who knows, I might read more of her work and it might fall flat. However, I'm so excited to read more of her work that it, she feels like the obvious and only answer to this question. So Edna Ferber is, is it. And I would love to read So Big, which is her Pulitzer Prize winning book, um, this year. I, I have a lot of other plans for my Pulitzer Prize project. We'll get to them toward the end of the video because one of the prompts does kind of ask. But if there's room in between, I would love to fit that one in. And I have copies of Giant, Saratoga Trunk, and um, Ice Palace, and Showboat. Uh, and I'm trying to collect some other books of hers so I can read them because I really enjoyed Fanny herself so much that she feels like an author that I'm going to love and really enjoy discovering and uh, trying all of her work. So I'm looking forward to doing that. And again, I've only read one of her books, so I don't know that I can call her a favorite new author, but she's definitely the author that I'm most excited to read more from uh, that I have read so far in 2023. Prompt number eight is one that I don't like, and I feel like I complain about it every year. Newest fictional crush. I don't really get book crushes, so I always have to find a way of making this question accessible to myself. So I thought, you know, who is a character that I just find adorable and would probably want to, you know, give a hug and maybe sit down, have lunch with, and get a cup of coffee? And the answer is Arthur, not Teddy. Arthur from Arthur and Teddy are coming out by Ryan Love. Um, Arthur is the older man. He's a grandfather who comes out of the closet and which inspires his grandson to do it. I didn't really like Teddy anywhere near as much, but Arthur is this adorable man. He has this great spirit. He is a very ethical and good person and just has a really sweet story. So not a fictional crush. I just don't get those really. No judgment on anyone who does, but it just doesn't happen to me. So this is the closest I can get to that question. And again, it's Arthur, not Teddy. Teddy is not. <laughs> I, I would. I don't know that I would get lunch with Teddy. Not to be mean, but there it is. And then prompt number 10 is a... Uh, sorry, I'm jumping it. Prompt number 9 is the next one, and that is your newest favorite character. It comes from uh, Fanny Herself by Edna Ferber. It's Fanny Brandeis. She is so relatable, even a hundred years, more than a hundred years after that book was published. She feels like someone who could be existing in the world today. She feels fully realized. And um, I actually did have a hard time because I think Ailey Pearl Garfield from The Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois is a fantastic and really well-realized character, but because she's so realistic, she's not as fun as Fanny from Fanny herself seems, so I had to go in that direction. Um, but her journey just feels relatable. Part of what I really loved about Fanny herself is that it feels like a book that could exist now. Well, it obviously it does exist. You know what I mean? It could have been written now. Um, a lot of these struggles that Fanny has are relatable to a modern audience. You know, she is someone who grows up and experiences grief and loss and loses her way a little bit and has to try to find a way to reconcile um, success and passion and a way to do what she wants in life and what she is passionate about. And uh, apparently we're about to have a thunderstorm where I live. I don't know if you heard that, but uh, yeah. So if there's loud noise, it's a thunderstorm. Anyway, uh, she's a really fantastic character who nav navigates all of those things and feels fully relatable to me. Prompt number 10 is a book that made you cry. Parentheses, saddest book you have read. Well, this isn't the saddest book I've read in 2023. However, I, I looked through, and I, maybe I don't remember books that have made me cry. I'm sure there are more. But I know I had a good cry when I read The Gunkle by Stephen Rowley. Because this is a book that is very much about processing grief. Not just for the children who have lost their mother at the beginning of the book, but for our protagonist, Patrick, 
who is the uncle of these children and who has lost uh, their mother was his best friend before she married his brother and so he's lost her but he also has lost um a lover uh, a partner um years earlier and he's still processing that so this is a book that is very much about processing grief and uh, finding ways to move on and it's about family and love and it's just a really sweet book, and it hit me in a lot of places that are meaningful for me. I, you know, if you follow along, you know I, I I have been on my own journey with grief since we lost a dog last year, and this definitely helped process a lot of the feelings uh, that were are still still lingering about that, um, and that's probably why I had such a good cry <laughs> uh, toward the end of it. It, it. It's a book that will always kind of mean a lot to me because of that. That takes us to prompt number 11, a book that made you happy. Well, I don't own a copy of it, but I actually just finished it on audio. It's Alice Austin Lived Here by Alex Gino. Alex Gino writes middle grade books. So part of me feels like, I, yeah, I don't know, people won't take me seriously if I talk about them, but they're just such cute books. Obviously, Alex Gino is most popularly known for writing Melissa, which was formerly named George uh, and Rick, which is a sort of quasi-sequel to Melissa, but Alice Austin Lived Here was recommended to me by someone last year, and I finally got around to it as part of my Pride Month reading for this June of 2023, and it's just such a cute book. It follows two non-binary middle schoolers who are assigned a project for school. Um, basically, the Historical Society on Staten Island is going to put up a statue of someone who has a famous person who has ties to Staten Island. So they are assigned an essay project to um, make a case for who they think the statue should be. These two non-binary kids discover Alice Austin, who did not identify as a lesbian, but didn't. And that's one of the things that's really clever about this book. It allows for history to be complicated and allows you to understand how you know queer history in particular gets difficult when it gets older because Alice Austin lived as a lesbian and embraced a sort of queer lifestyle but wouldn't have had the language to identify herself as a lesbian necessarily so it's not like today, uh, you know, the, the ways of identifying yourself and declaring yourself and coming out uh, didn't exist during her lifetime. And she's a real life person, by the way. She was a photographer who lived on Staten Island. And um, it's just such a cute book. The reason it makes me happy is that I'm so, just so glad that these books of Alex Gino's exist and that middle, middle graders will pick them up and hopefully adults as well, because I really enjoy them. Um, it gives me hope for the future, and I'm so glad that someone as intelligent as Alex Gino is helping teach children about learning who they are, even if it might be difficult, and accepting themselves. And also, in Alice Austin Lived Here in particular, learning about their past, and learning to respect the past, and uh, apply compassion to other people. Um, I just love that these books exist, and that is why this one makes me so happy. Which takes us to prompt number 12, favorite book-to-film adaptation you saw this year. For a moment, I didn't think I had read a book that had been adapted or seen a movie based on a book, but no, it actually happened this past week. A Room with a View by E.M. Forster, which is a fantastic book and a fantastic movie adaptation as well. It was directed by James Ivory, and it is pretty perfect. It makes some cuts to the story, but it still it implies uh, uh, or makes gestures toward all the things that it cuts. So it's a really fantastic adaptation. Even if I had seen a lot of book-to-film adaptations in 2023, uh, I, I think this one would still be pulling ahead of the pack because it is a pretty flawless film adaptation of a truly excellent book. So, yeah even though it's the only one I can think of, um, it is far, it is a very superior book to movie adaptation. That takes us to prompt number 13, favorite review you've written this year or the booktube version. What is your favorite video you have done so far in this year? I thought about some of my Pulitzer Prize deep dives, some reviews and things like that. But you know, at the end of the day, I think my Pulitzer Prize reaction video is my favorite video that I've done so far in 2023. And uh, hopefully, if you follow along, you would agree. I know a lot of people were... Is. So I did a live... Well, I didn't do a live video, but I filmed myself 
as they were announcing the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction this year, and it was a tie, and I was really rooting for Demon Copperhead, but I thought it was going to be Trust. Um, so you can imagine, since they both tied, that uh, it, I had quite a reaction. It was, yeah. And what's funny is, I almost didn't film myself watching the results or watching the announcement, because I was like, oh, I'm just worried it's going to be boring. I'm so glad I filmed it. Um, it was a, it was a true moment of shock and joy for me because I was so happy about Demon Copperhead winning a Pulitzer Prize for Fiction and that Barbara Kingsolver, one of, uh, who I think is a great writer, uh, and truly deserves a Pulitzer Prize, finally got one. So that was a, I'll have that video linked down below, uh, if you have not seen it, but I, I think there's no question that has to be my favorite video that I have done so far in 2023. Will anything top it? I don't know. We'll find out. Prompt number 14, most beautiful book you've bought so far this year or received. And this is where Inland Island is going to come back. However, I do have two others. I'm going to get, have three answers for this question. Uh, Inland Island is something I had ordered. Um, actually, I got it from the library. And the library copy of the book was so beautiful that I really wanted to find a used copy. There is a new edition of this that was reprinted last year. But I really wanted to try to get one that had the same illustrations that the library book had. And the dust jacket alone is pretty gorgeous. And I am so glad that I managed to find one. This, I believe, is actually a first edition. I'm going to be very careful taking off the dust jacket right now so I can show you what is underneath. It's this cloth cover. And you can see the pattern on the dust jacket is here as well. It's already it's stunning. But... One of the things that makes this so beautiful is that it has these really staggering illustrations inside. There's one for every chapter, and again, every chapter is a month on this property. So you have January here, and let me just find one more. Whichever chapter I get to, uh, here's February. Really a beautiful, beautiful book. And I'm so glad that I managed to, to get this copy in particular because I just think it is absolutely stunning. And I'm so glad that I get to have this one in my library. So this was the library book that I'd read, um, but without the dust jacket. So I'm glad that I got one with the dust jacket as well. The other two are books that I found when we were in Pullman, Washington, where my dog Jamie was getting treatment for uh, a nasal tumor. And... There is a fantastic used bookstore in Pullman, Washington called Bruised Books, B-R-U-S-E-D, and kind of bruised, but also used. It's, it's, it's fun. And it's a great store. They have so many really beautiful books and uh, fun finds in there. It, it's one of those stores you could spend an entire day looking around. And in fact, I did. <laughs> one of the two is this edition of Travels with Charlie by John Steinbeck. You can see this really adorable illustration right there on the cover. And these photos on the back, that is John Steinbeck. That is his poodle, Charlie. They traveled around on a road trip around America. And um, I just love this illustration so much. It's so good. And then not only is that great, but I'm going to, again, be very careful taking off the dust jacket so I can show you what's underneath. Oh, and actually, before I get rid of the dust jacket or put it to the side, there's a cute picture of John Steinbeck and Charlie right there. All right. On the cover of the book, which is, again, cloth, uh, you have a fun illustration of Charlie. Beautiful spine on the book itself. And there's a map on the inside flap. And if you know me, you know I love a book with a map. How fun is that? And you can see... John Steinbeck and Charlie all around. There are some bears. It's it, it's so fun. I don't think there's much of anything else inside, but just that, that packaging on that book is really stunning. And this is a book that I would love to read this year, um, but I don't know if I'll get around to it. You know, there are a lot of books that I would like to try to get to this year. So that's one. And then the other one I found is this Folio Society edition of Goodbye to Berlin by Christopher Isherwood, which 
it originally would have had a slip cover and this doesn't anymore but it's just a really beautiful edition of this book uh goodbye to berlin is helps form the inspiration for cabaret um there, it was a play uh and then it was a, the musical cabaret and then it was a movie of the musical um and it has illustrations as well so that's a really fun and beautiful uh edition of this book i already had a copy of this um here's another illustration just really a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful book. I'm running out of space on this pile, so I'm going to put that one back there. And that takes us to the final prompt, prompt number 15. What books do you need to read by the end of the year? And every year I take issue with the wording of this because I don't need to read anything by the end of the year, especially since I'm a mood reader. You know, I try not to put that kind of pressure on myself. I don't like saying you need to do this by the end of the year. Um, reading should be fun you know, supposedly fun. It's supposed to be fun. So I try not to do that. There are things I would like to read this year. And of those, of course, Let Us Descend by Jessamyn Ward, which will be released on October 3rd, is one of them. I am really looking forward to that book, and I would be so happy to read it. So I'm going to say that, but I have a couple of other ones. And some of these are for my Pulitzer Prize project. And I've been thinking about Pulitzer Prize winning authors who have a book coming out and there are three of them and then there's one book that actually is part of a Pulitzer Prize project that has a film adaptation coming out and I would like to read it or rather reread it for my Pulitzer Prize project. Let's get into those. So the first author who qualifies for that is Jhumpa Lahiri. She won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction for Interpreter of Maladies which is her debut actually. She won a Pulitzer for her debut. Uh, it is a story collection. I love this story collection. It is one of my favorites, and I've been looking for an excuse to reread it anyway. She has a new book called Roman Stories that is coming out later this year. I can't remember when, and I'm really looking forward to it. So I think it would be fun to read Interpreter of Maladies and get my Pulitzer Project, like deep dive on this out uh, in time for Roman Stories. Um, she's an author who's had a really interesting career, started with this obviously and then uh the namesake and uh she sort of pivoted she lives in italy now i believe and uh she has been writing in italian and then translating into english which is a very interesting career trajectory and uh i would love to read this as a way of sort of building up my own anticipation for roman stories and the same is true for michael cunningham he won a pulitzer prize for the hours and has a new book called Day, which is coming out later this year. And um, I actually have access to Day on NetGalley, so I'm looking forward to reading that. And um, The Hours will be an interesting one because I read it a while ago and uh, wasn't too keen on it. So uh, part of me is thinking I should read Mrs. Dalloway and then read The Hours again, and then I'll be set up for Day when it is released. So he is another one uh, who has a book coming out, and I would like to um, read The Hours as a way of sort of building myself up. And then there's Stephen Milhauser, who won a Pulitzer Prize for Martin Dressler, The Tale of an American Dreamer. Lesser known author, lesser known Pulitzer book, but he has a book called Disruptions, which is a story collection coming out uh, later this year. And I have only read one book by Stephen Milhauser at this point, and it was Dangerous Laughter, which is a story collection. And I liked it a lot. I don't remember it all that well, and I don't actually have a copy of it anymore. But I remember really liking it. And because of that, he has always been someone I'm, I've been curious by. So I'm looking forward to his new book, which is stories like Dangerous Laughter was, but this is the one that he won a Pulitzer for. So it is also obviously of interest to me. And then the Pulitzer winner that has a film adaptation coming out, you may have guessed by now, it's The Color Purple by Alice Walker. And uh, I would love to reread the book maybe rewatch the 1985 movie and then get into the uh so the movie that's coming out later this year is a film version of the musical the color purple uh which has been on broadway twice so i'd like to read this before that comes out as well so uh that is the mid-year book freakout tag for me i'd love to hear your answers to these questions if you uh, don't have a channel you can leave them in the comment section down below if you have a channel feel free to do this yourself. I would love to hear your responses. And if you have thoughts about anything I've talked about, let me know in the comment section down below. As always, I really appreciate your time and I will be back until next time. Happy reading.